Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us tonight. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks, we give you praise. God, we're just honored to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you for what you've already done in this place tonight. Many were healed and delivered, God, restored. Father, books could be written about what you did in this room. Lord, we praise you for that, but God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further with you, God. We pray that tonight as we open up your word, you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly, God, we did not come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. God, we've come to hear from the true teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need, even the instruction and the correction. God, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters at no time we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest. God, for Oak Valley, Oasis, for uh, Lord, the, the well and the way. God, we thank you, Lord, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. God, all the great churches that are out there, too many to name, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for the assemblies of God, for the four square denominations, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, all those that are lifting up Jesus, bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, we say? Amen. Amen. Well, last week, I got to clear something up about last week, okay? Everybody ready for this? How many of you heard the message last week? All right? Okay, good, good. A lot of you guys are here. Now, now I don't want to be misunderstood that you can't say you're proud of anybody, okay? Because people have been kind of tiptoeing around the office this week and even around the family kind of going, no, shh, shh, you can't say that you're proud of that, okay? Listen, I understand new terminology and, and, and usage and that sort of a thing. So don't, uh, hopefully none of you guys thought that Pastor Dan said that you can't be proud of your children or proud of your job or anything like that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just listen to the message last week and you'll be confused too and it'll be all good, okay? Okay, so anyways, but listen, this is, this is, you might say, Pastor, that's radical. Listen, I don't know any other Christianity other than radical Christianity. So, you know, uh, uh, but, but that still doesn't mean that in modern day terminology, you can't use those phrases, okay? So the title of tonight's message is Other Stuff That We Can't Say, all right? <laughs> just, just playing with you guys. I got a really serious message, so you guys want to hear a joke? Okay, a doctor was, was talking to his patient, and he said, you are in terrible shape. You've got to do something about it. First, tell your wife to cook more nutritious meals. Stop working like a dog. Also, inform your wife you're going to make a budget, and she has to stick to it. And have her keep the kids off your back so that you can rely. I haven't even finished a joke. You guys are laughing. This is great. Have her keep the kids off your back so you can relax. Unless there's some changes like that in your life, you're probably going to be dead in a month. Doc, the patient says... This, this would sound more official coming from you. I, I wonder, could you please call my wife and give her those instructions? And so the doctor agreed and, and, and said, oh, go ahead and, and head home. I'll call her that way when you, when you get home. You know, you guys can talk about this. So when the fellow got home, his wife rushed out to him and said, I talked to your doctor. She wailed, poor man, you've only got 30 days to live. <laughs> Tonight, the title of the message, the real title of the message is Determining What We Become. Determining What We Become. Uh, Isaac Newton, a very famous mathematician, many of you guys know who he is, right? Apple on the head, that sort of a thing. His first law of motion states that everything continues in a state of rest unless it's compelled to change by forces impressed on it. Okay, you guys got that? So in the natural, with gravity, with objects, with matter, all that kind of stuff, everything will continue in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed on it. I would submit to you tonight that natural things are a lot like spiritual things. 
Why do I say that? Because in, the, in the, the natural, we can see certain things. And in fact, even when you look at the teachings of Jesus, you'll find oftentimes Jesus used natural things to teach us lessons of what was happening in the spirit. That's why you always find Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And all of a sudden, he starts talking about planting seed. He starts talking about mustard trees. He starts talking about fishermen. He starts talking about olive presses, right? He starts talking about all these different things in the natural. Why? Because natural things can teach us about spiritual things. I believe that it's God's design that way. Why? Because how are we going to understand something unseen, something spiritual, without having an object lesson in the natural? That's why the Bible tells us that all of the stories in the Old Testament, when you read the New Testament, you find out in the book of 1 Corinthians, all the stories contained in the Old Testament are not just history lessons. They are examples for us. Why? So that we can live our lives in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, in a way that we fear the Lord, in a way that we don't mess around with God. Are you listening tonight? And so when we see things in the natural, we can take lessons and draw from it for the spiritual. Now, very interesting because the spiritual created the natural. Therefore, if God is the spirit creating the natural, then God knows what he's doing when he's putting things into place. So that's why I open tonight with Isaac Newton's first law of motion. Everything continues in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed on it. In the spirit, I believe it is very similar. In other words, as a Christian, as somebody who wants to become something, remember we're talking about determining what we become. We will not become anything if we just sit around like a bump on a log waiting for dry rot to set in. Are you listening? Nothing is going to happen if we do nothing. Why? Because what you sow, you reap. So if you do nothing, you'll get nothing, and you'll get nothing in abundance. Are you listening? See, that's how this works. So tonight, I want to talk about some forces that determine what we become. In other words, there are some things that we can do. There's some things we can look at that will determine what we become. If we understand these principles and we understand these forces, then these forces in the spiritual will act on our life and now we can start to produce motion, we can start to produce momentum, we can start to walk on the path to change. Why? Because I don't want to be the same person I am today, tomorrow. I want to be different tomorrow. I want to be growing tomorrow. I want to be in a a better place tomorrow. I want to be walking closer with God tomorrow. I want to have a, a greater relationship with my wife and children tomorrow. I want to be more prosperous tomorrow. I, I want to have all the promises of God in my tomorrows. Anybody, anybody hear what I'm saying tonight? Okay, you guys are staring quite a bit right now, okay? So, so you got to shake yourself up a little bit, say a little amen, okay? Because the more you stare, the more I preach, all right? So we could be here till midnight tonight. <laughs> Forces that de- determine what we become. First one is, is that what you leave determines what you become. What you leave determines what you become. In other words, if you stay in the same spot, you're going to stay the same. And unless you're willing to change, unless you're willing to leave some things, you cannot become what you want to be. We see this in the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Many of us know this as the love chapter, right? We find out what the, the character of love is, the nature of love, the attributes of love. Also, when you, when you put God in there, right, because God is love, you start to see the character of God through this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 11, take a look at it. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Now stop right there and look up at me. So he says... As a child, there were some things that were incorporated in my life. My language, my understanding, my thought life, right? I thought like that. But look at this. But when I became a man, everybody say became. Became. See, because he was a child. And he had certain things around him as a child. But when he became something, when I became a man, I did what? Put away childish things. In other words, what he left determined what he became. See, that's why we see a lot of very childish adults, because they never left the childish things. I remember, you know, my dad was talking about the the company that he worked for, and he said, man, we got a whole lot of 40-year-old children still writing on the bathroom walls dirty messages about the boss. See, they never left childish things. Even though these were grown men, they still were writing on the bathroom walls. You've got to be kidding me. 
There are much more mature ways of handling your frustrations towards your boss. And yet that's how they were coping with life. See, in the same way, if we don't leave childish things, we will never become mature the way God has called us to be. How about this? We leave sin to become holy. See, if you want to become holy, if you read the word of God and God speaks to us and God says to us, be ye holy as I am holy, you cannot do that if you're not ready to leave your sinful past behind. If you want to still wallow in that mud or return to that vomit, you are not going to be holy. Why? Because you have to leave that sin in order to become holy because what you leave determines what you become. We leave childish ways to become mature. As Christians, are we still gossiping about people? Are we still going out there and, and, and acting petty? Is it about me? Are we being selfish and childish? See, if you want to become mature, especially mature in the faith, which that, that's the point of church, if you want to know the truth, it's to win souls and to make disciples. We get people saved, and then we grow them up into maturity in Christ. That's why you're here tonight, is to, to worship the Lord, to connect with God, to be in the company of believers, and as well, to hear the fresh word of the Lord that will Will grow you up into maturity. That's why we come together. That's the purpose of church. And so we have to leave childish ways. You know, as a teenager, I love sleeping in. My goodness, my wife can attest to this because I've been sleeping in lately, you know, but now my sleeping is like 8, 8.30, you know, and I'm like, man, that was good sleeping in. I used to make, you know, I used to be like the Olympic sleep-in guy, you know. I could do 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then be up all night, that sort of a thing. And, and you know, when, when I grew up and when I started getting mature, I realized if I want to keep a job, can't sleep in. We got married, went off to Bible college. If I want to graduate Bible college, hello, can't sleep in. Kids start having kids, right? Kids got to get to school. You want to get the kids to school on time? You cannot be sleeping. And so we have to leave childish things. Many people don't leave the way of the world to be joined to Christ. And they never become the Christian God has called them to be, even though they want to be mature, even though they want to be spiritually, you know, th this giant. They're saying, guy, I, I want to do great works for God. I, I want to be used by God. I want God to do things in my life. And yet they're still playing patty cake. And God's saying, you want to be used. It's time to put away childish things in your language, in your understanding, in your thoughts. And it's time to move on to maturity. What you leave determines what you become. Uh, this works in marriage, if you, if you like. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse number 31. You guys probably could quote this verse if you've been around this church for any period of time when we've talked about marriage. But in Ephesians, chapter 5, talking about our marriages, and really it's a picture of Christ in the church. Ephesians, chapter 5, verse number 31 says, For this reason a man shall do what? Oh, that was like weak. Come on now. So shall a man do what? Leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. The two shall become. See, he left his father and his mother to be joined to his wife. In the same way as a Christian, we have left sin, we have left the world, we have left the family of the devil because the devil was our father before. Now we have left all of that behind. We've left that old man. That old man has died. I've been crucified with Christ and now I am joined to my new partner. Now I'm joined to Christ and now I can become one with him. See, marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. That's why many marriages fail is because people don't leave the old ways of the past. They're still saying, well, my family never did it like that. My mama didn't do that. My daddy never did that. Well, that's how we've always done it. And the partner's sitting there going, I'm going to smack you, sucker. <laughs> why? Because you should have left that. Been married for 20 years and we're still talking about what mom and dad did. L listen, it's time to leave mom and dad. So shall a man leave his father and mother. Now, that doesn't just mean proximity, even though if, you know, hello. Okay. 
But, but that doesn't mean you can never see your family again. What that means is, is that, look at uh, that was my family, but I'm leaving, and now I'm joining myself together to be one with you, and I'm not going to drag those old ways back in to our new relationship, to our new marriage. Now, some of the things, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything, you know, because there are some traditions, there are some wonderful things that you can bring into your marriage from your family and from your past and from your history. Traditions, you know, at Christmas, we always did a gingerbread house. Okay, well, let's do that with the kids, you know. That's wonderful. But if, if, if dad had a bad habit of coming home, kicking off his boots and, and, and just sitting on the couch and doing nothing, that may not be a good tradition for your family. You, you might have an angry wife standing behind you just like, oh, I'm just waiting to knock him out, right? Why? Because you never left. It's time for us to grow up into maturity. We're in a new family. Now we've joined ourselves to Christ, which brings us to the second force that determines what we become. First one is what you leave determines be what you become. But second, who you join determines who you become. Not only what you leave. See, you could leave certain things behind, join yourself up to something new. Maybe, maybe you've heard of the person that left cigarettes behind and then they, they, they joined themselves to the refrigerator, right? Because they needed something in their mouth. Somebody left drugs for alcohol, right? They just switched drugs. They left one addiction for another. See, in our life, it's not only what we leave, but who we join that determines what we become. Very important who you surround yourself with. This works in marriage, this works in friendships, this works in your church. See, where you fellowship in church determines what you will become. In this church, we're a soul-winning church. We are a passionate church. We are a word-driven church. So you know what our Christians that attend this church look like? They're soul winners. They're out there telling people, well, you don't get saved just by going to church. Right? Telling people, wait, just because you were raised in church, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions in church, that doesn't mean that you're a Christian going to heaven. Just because you know God doesn't mean the devil in hell knows who God is. He's not a Christian, right? And, and see, what, what happened? They were hanging around this place. They heard an altar call, and all of a sudden, they got it on the inside of them, and because of who they were hanging out with, determined what they became. People on the job, why are you so passionate? Well, I go to a passionate church. Why are you so loud? Because we loud in my church. Sorry, I got a little San Bernardino on you. <laughs> Very important, though. See, who you link up with, who you join, determines who you become. Let's take a look at it in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15 this time. 1 Corinthians 15. Take a look at it in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verse number 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse number 33, do not be deceived. Everybody say, do not be deceived. Not deceived. You know why he said that? Because we could be deceived. We could have a wrong thought about this area of our life. Don't be deceived. Don't get fooled. Don't get caught in the wrong thing. Evil company corrupts good habits. But pastor, I love him. And maybe if I bring him to church, he'll get saved, and then we can get married as Christians. Girl, can I tell you something? He's not after your God. But pastor, I don't have any Christian friends. And you know, the guys, they go out and they may get a little rowdy. They may have a couple drinks, but I'm strong enough I can handle that. Can I tell you something, bro? Hang around long enough, evil company corrupts good habits. You may have a good habit of not drinking, but you hang out with those guys long enough. It's going to happen. Time to get some Christian friends. Time to hang out with the people of God. Time to find some people who will build you up in your most holy faith. Who you join determines who you become. That's why we have so many teenagers Shaving their heads to look like the latest, greatest, coolest, you know, combing their hair this way because that guy did it, right? Wearing the pants here and the shorts here and the shirt here. and this. Why? Because they, they want to join themselves up with that kind of person. They all want to be different, but then you know who they, who they hang out with because they're all different the same. 
All wearing the same hat, the same shoes, the same, right? It's true. Look around. You will see. Who you join determines who you become. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. Isn't that interesting? You hang around wise people. You're going to become wise. Why? Because who you join determines who you become. You'll start to hear the way that they think, and you'll go, huh, I never looked at it that way. But that makes sense. You'll start to see the decisions that they make, and you'll start to see their outcomes, and you'll say, huh, I get it. I get, well, that, 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 that works. And you'll start to do what they do. But the companion of fools will be what? Destroy. Let me ask you guys a question here at the Rock Church. Anybody want to be destroyed? Didn't think so. So that means we need to find some wise people to hang out with. We need to surround ourselves with people of faith. Now, that doesn't mean you exclude yourself from the world. You'd have to be zapped out, beam me up Jesus style to get out from all of the, the people on the planet, right? But you need to surround yourself, your closest people, the people that are speaking into your life, the people that are, are nearest to you should be people of faith, people that can build you up. And then when you are with the people that are ungodly on the job or, you know, if you have a friendship from way back when, go and have lunch, that stuff is cool, but don't make it a habit. Make the people that are closest to you that are speaking into your life, people that will build you up in faith because who you join determines who you become. Plain and simple. Now let me show you the person you should be joined to the most because when we join Jesus, we become like him, like him in his nature, right? Now the Bible says we can participate in the divine nature of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Your one, number one fellowship should be with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We become like him in his resurrection when you join yourself to Jesus. That old man is buried and now you are raised again with Christ. And like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you see the works that he did, Elijah quoted it tonight, greater works shall you do because I go to my Father, right? Because he sensed the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, to live on the inside of us. So as you join up with Jesus, as you link up with Jesus, you become like him. We show this to you in the Word. Jesus had called a lot of people, and a lot of people followed him, a lot of people didn't. But look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become Fishers of men. And that's just what happens. These fishermen who were out there fishing on the Sea of Galilee now followed Jesus. They left their nets. They forsook everything, and they followed Jesus. Left their homes, left their land, left their business, followed Jesus. Jesus made them fishers of men. Thousands on the day of Pentecost saved. Why? Because they followed Jesus. The same way in our life, if you want to be like Jesus, you need to hang out with them. You need to spend time in prayer. You need to spend time worshiping the Lord. You need to spend time in the Word of God. You need to spend time in church. You need to, to, to talk to Jesus. You need to sing to Jesus. You need to just love on Him in every area of your life. Are you listening? Yeah. Bring us to the next one. What you behold determines who you become. What you behold determines who you become become. Maybe you've heard it said like this. I wish I knew who the first person was who said this so that I could quote them, but there are so many people who have said this, so many different quotes that I, I don't even know who said it the first time. Maybe it was something just inspired by the Holy Spirit that a lot of people got a hold of. But maybe you've heard this. You will become like what you worship. Anybody heard that? Okay. Pastor Deborah put it this way. What you look at the longest becomes strongest in your life. In other words, as you gaze into someone, something long enough, you will become like that person or that thing, right? We talked about teenagers, right? Here they are looking at the pop stars, and the next thing you know, they start becoming like them. What they have beheld the longest has become strongest, and they have started to conform to that image. They've started to dress that way. They've started to act that way. You know, some of them start to walk that way, right? And, and, and their, their attitudes, their behaviors, they start reflecting the things that they are beholding. In the same way that that works in the negative, it works in the positive. If you behold the positive, you behold Jesus, if you behold uh, uh, the goodness of God, the glory of God, you will start to be changed. Let's take a look at the negative first. Psalm 115. Turn there with me. Psalm 115. Great set of verses in the Bible. Book of Psalms, you'll find it right there in the middle of your Bible. 
Psalms 115. Everybody doing okay? You guys are making me nervous. You're so quiet. I'll have to work harder. Psalm 115, verse 4 through verse number 8. Let's read it together. Psalm 115, starting in verse number 4. Take a look at it. It says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Verse 5. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. Verse 6. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. Verse 7. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Describing an idol. idol. Idols are carved to look like images of men, images of beings, beasts, different things, right? They carve them out of wood. In fact, in, in Isaiah chapter 44, he starts talking about, doesn't the person who bows down to an idol realize that he just cut a piece of wood in half? Out of one half, he made an idol he's bowing down to, and the other half, he cooked his dinner on it, right? Doesn't he, doesn't he realize this stupid thing that he just cooked his dinner on is the same thing he's bowing down and worshiping and thanking? But look at the next verse. Even though they have all the attributes of a man, all the attributes of appearance, of looking like they should have some sort of power, some sort of ability, they don't. Now take a look at verse number 8. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. In other words, when you worship something that has no voice, has no sight, has no hearing, has no ability, you will be impotent, you will be dumb, you will be mute, you will be deaf. And I'm not saying that as a derogatory term. I'm saying that because you're trusting in an idol and something other than God, now you are taking away your effectiveness in the natural and in the spiritual. It's really what that's talking about. Why? Because you're beholding something, you're putting something, an idol is anything that you place in front of God. Anything that takes the place of God in your life has become an idol to you. If it's money, then that money has become your idol. You're bowing down and you're worshiping it and that money cannot save your soul and you will become like it, ineffective in life. Same way, maybe sex has become your God and you've been putting that in front of God. You've been beholding that. You're going to start having thoughts. You're going to try and carry out those thoughts. You're going to go down a very, very dark path that leads to a tar pit and eventually leads to hell. Can we talk? Can we say it like it is? If you don't like that, read the book of Proverbs. The path of the adulteress leads to hell. That's what the Bible says. Plain and simple. And as we behold things and we put those things, if sports has gotten in the way of God, that's all you're going to do. You're going to buy jerseys. You're going to look like the sports guy. You're going to be talking sports. You won't be able to relate with people when they start talking about life and family. It's all going to be sports. Anything that takes the place of God has become an idol. And it will produce ineffective results in your life. But the good news is that you don't have to look at that stuff. The good news is, is that what you behold determines who you become. So if you're beholding all those other things, you'll become like those things. But if you behold Jesus, then you will become like Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Turn there with me. Turn there with me. I cut you open. Let me sew you up here. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Last verse of chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, great verse. Look at this. He's been talking about how anytime the, the Old Testament law is preached, there's a veil over the heart of the people, it's something that's, that's taking the place of God. It's covering them from seeing the light of the gospel. Okay? Verse 18, he says this. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Look at that. Beholding. Beholding as in a what? A mirror. You know, when, when you look in a mirror, it's right there. You're face to face. You're taking time, you're looking. Looking and you can see imperfections. You can also see 
features, characteristics, aspects, beholding as in a mirror. Look at this, the glory of the Lord. So in other words, you're getting in the face of God in an intimate way. Now all of a sudden you can see the attributes of God. You can see the glory of the Lord. You can see his face. You can see his smile. You can see his pleasure. You can see his acceptance. You can see his love. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Look at this. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the Lord. In other words, what you worship is what you will become. If you worship God, then you will become like God. I hope you guys are getting a hold of this tonight. Because as you behold the glory of the Lord, as you look in the face of Jesus, as you pray and as you worship him, as you come into his house and you lift up your hands and lift up your voice, as you hear the word of the Lord, as you take time during your day to spend time with Jesus, then you're going to be transformed into his image. You will become like him. You'll become holy, you'll become powerful, you'll become effective, you'll have a voice, you'll be able to see, you'll be able to hear, you'll be able to speak, you'll be able to have the power of God on your behalf to do great and mighty works on the earth as you behold your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Forces that determine what we become. Number one, what you leave determines what you become. Number two, what you join, who you join determines who you become. Third one we looked at is what you behold determines who you become. Last one for tonight. You guys got time for one more? I know you do. What you believe determines what you become. What you believe determines what you become. You've heard as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? What you believe determines what you become. If you believe God can't, or if you believe God won't, that's going to determine things in your life. But if you believe all things are possible to him who believes, if you believe the word of the Lord, which says nothing will be impossible with God, if you believe the word of God in any area of your life, then that's going to determine what you become. Now, this is not some psycho-cybernetics, new age, guru, goofball stuff, all right? That's not what this message is about is, if I just think of myself as handsome, I'll become handsome. No, that's not what this is about, okay? If I see myself as successful, then I'll be successful. No, you can't just think, 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 think. No, you have to believe. You have to have faith. Faith has to have a source. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So therefore, based on the word of God, what you believe about the word of God determines what you will become in your life. If you don't believe it's the will of God for you to be healed, you will stay sick. If you believe it's God's will for you not to prosper, but that God wants you poor, broken down, busted, and disgusted, then you will never become anything else other than that. Why? Because you believe that that's the will of God for your life. But if you get a hold of the word of God and you start to see what God says about you, start to believe God for it, start to declare the word of God about your life, then you will become what God has called you to be. This works for our salvation, right? How many of you said, yeah, I want to become a Christian? You said yes to Jesus, right? What did you have to do to become a Christian? You had to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Then you became a Christian by being born again. We understand this when it comes to salvation. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received into them, he gave them the right to become children of God. Look at to who? To those who believe in his name. So we understand when it comes to salvation, I get saved not based on my works, not based on my effort, but based on what I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he went to the cross. I believe that he died for my sin. I believe that he was buried according to the scriptures and that he was raised again on the third day. I believe that he is now resurrected in heaven and he stands at the right hand of God as my high priest. I believe in him for my salvation. Therefore, I became born again and I am now a Christian. What you believe determines what you become. I think that God made salvation so all-encompassing, so amazing, so wonderful that our salvation teaches us much about our Christian walk. Because in order to even get started, you had to do some things. You had to leave the world and join yourself to Jesus, right? 
You had to behold Jesus. You had to look at him. Faith had to come by hearing. You had to hear the message. You had to behold Jesus. You had to get a picture of what he had done for you. You had to have that understanding. You had to leave. You had to join. You had to behold. And now you have to believe. The moment faith comes in, the moment you believe and you say, I believe, and you start to confess that Jesus Christ is now my Lord. He is my Savior. The Bible says you are born again. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have become new. So salvation teaches us this principle. Did you know this principle also works with God's promises for your life? Let's take a look at it. Turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter number 4. We can take a look at a couple of verses here. Romans chapter 4 is talking about Abraham. Abraham used to be Abram. He was a guy that God called out of another nation. He was a moon worshiper, the Bible tells us. God spoke to him and said, Abram, I want you to get out of your father's house. I want you to leave your father's house, and I want you to go to the place where I show you. So Abraham leaves that land, Ur of the Chaldeans, and then he joins himself to God and follows God, and God starts speaking promises to him. Now, Abram was very old and had no children, had no child, and had no son to carry on his name. Therefore, God spoke to him, and God said, I will give you descendants. God even changes his name to Abraham, father of many nations. And now in the book of Romans, here the apostle Paul is writing about him and telling us about the example of Abraham's life that's for us today. Okay, let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 17, and verse number 18. Look at this. Romans chapter 4, studying verse number 17, says this. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now, this is before he ever had a child. God is speaking to him and says, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. In other words, God was declaring things that were going to happen before they ever happened. God was speaking things before they ever surfaced. God was declaring his will. Why? So that when it came to pass, we would know that he is God. And so here God is declaring those things that the book, Old King James Version, that be not as if they were, right? Now verse number 18, take a look at it. Verse number 18, who, speaking of Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. In other words, Abraham in the natural looked around and said, I'm old, 90 years old, my wife, 80 years old. And through the promises, 91, 92, 93, 94, all the way up to 99 years old. He's hearing God speaking this. And God is telling him, I've made you a father of many nations. Your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. And here Abraham believes him contrary to what he sees in his body. His body was already past childbearing years. His wife's womb was past childbearing years. And yet contrary to hope. So see, they would have had no hope in the world. Contrary to hope, in hope, believed. He just took God at his word. He said, okay, that's what you're saying? Okay, that's how it's going to be. Contrary to hope, in hope, believed. So that he became, everybody say he became. became. See, we're talking about becoming what God has called us to be. Determining what we will become. What you believe will determine what you become. Abraham believed God's word that he would become the father of nations. And therefore he became, why? Because contrary to hope and hope he believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants B, let me ask you a question, church. Do you have a promise from God? You've got tens of thousands of them sitting right there in your lap. I would encourage you to find out the promise of God for your life. What do you believe in God for? If you're sitting here tonight and you say, I'm not believing God for nothing, then it's time to get a hold of a promise. Time to believe God. Time to get a seed in your life. Time to get a hold of something. Get a hold of this book. Get this book on the inside of you. Devour it if you have to. My goodness, get inside of it. Why? So that it can get inside of you. And so that you can start to believe God for great things in your life. You don't have to be like the people who have gone before you. We do not have to be the way that it was always because that's just the way it is. 
God wants us to become great, mighty, powerful, victorious. Why? Because Jesus is great, mighty, powerful, and victorious. He already is. And therefore, if we're going to become like him, then there's got to be some things that are going to happen. We've got to believe the word of God, believe it enough to act on it, and to confess it over our lives. How do we do that? Factors that determine what we become. Number one, what you leave determines what you become. Some of you guys might need to leave some stuff. Might need to go leave some stuff in the trash. You know what I'm saying? Might be time to get rid of that old stuff, that old man stuff. Cut the cord. Maybe you need to delete some things off of your computers or your phones. Might be time to, to cut off some, some ungodly relationships that are dragging you down. How do we do that? Well, who you join determines who you become. Some of you guys need to hang out with us here at The Rock some more. Some of you guys used to come to Sunday morning, Sunday night. Some of you guys used to be passionate. Some of you ladies used to come to girlfriends and you backed off and you don't know why. It's time to join up. Time to link up with people of faith. Time to get, ask about a small group. Dr. Becker's right here on the front row, shaking his head. Okay, wave at everybody, Dr. Becker. Okay, he will get you connected with a small group. And right next to him is his wife, Pastor Eleanor. She'll get you connected with a small group, okay? Some of you guys need to join up. Some of you guys need to make wise decisions. Some of you guys need to to find some godly people, some godly friends. Now listen, if you're married, stay married, okay? I'm not giving you permission to do anything dumb, okay? But you need to join up. You need to link up in faith with people that are going to encourage you in faith. What you behold determines what you become. It's time to stop beholding the things that are taking us down because we'll become like them. It's time to start beholding the face of Jesus. And finally, what you believe determines what you become. Get a hold of a promise of God for your life. Get a hold of the will and the word and the way of the Lord and start to act it out, live it out, start to walk it out, talk it out, start to declare the word of God because what you believe determines what you will become. You guys get anything out of the word of the Lord tonight? (laughs) Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys tonight. You guys have been great and just appreciate you guys. And I really do believe you got something from the word of the Lord. Let's make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. It'd be a tragedy. We came into the house of God, sang songs to God, had such a good time in praise and worship. Some of us got on our knees. Some of us cried. Some of us, I believe that people got healed tonight. I believe that people got free tonight. And, and be a tragedy if we came in, heard the word of the Lord and laughed together and enjoyed and, and got something from God. And yet you walked out of this place. Your heart wasn't right with God and you died you ended up in hell instead of going to heaven now sometimes people say well pastor I don't believe in hell you know I don't think that that's real I can't imagine uh, a loving God sending people to hell well listen God doesn't send people to hell unless they make that decision themselves because the Bible talks about hell Old and New Testament Jesus himself spoke of it so it's a very real place it was never intended for us never intended for mankind it was made for the devil and his angels who rebelled And yet God allows us the free will choice while we're here on the planet to make a decision with our lives where we're going to go, whether it be heaven or hell. Now, sometimes people think, well, don't all roads lead to heaven? Doesn't a loving God just let everyone in? Well, think about that for a second. Why would God send his son Jesus, beaten bloody, hung on a cross, go through all of the agony, all of the pain, all of the suffering, and then say, yeah, whatever you want to do, whatever they want to do, just all roads lead to heaven. You know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Can't get there just by driving around. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it. One way you're going to have to get there. In the same way, Jesus comes and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except by me. What does that mean? It means it's God's heaven. You're going to have to get there God's way. Come on tonight. Let me have your attention. Let's talk about your life. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been good. Doesn't God let good people into heaven? You know, I've been nice to my neighbors, given money to charities. You know, my good really outweighs my bad. Used to be bad. Now I'm good. I, I cleaned up my act, you know, and, and I've been a really good person. I, I think God's going to see that. And he's going to let me into heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does God say you just be a good person that, that gets you into heaven or that you can be good enough or make your good outweigh your bad or clean up your act. God doesn't say any of that. God didn't say get involved in social justice causes, even though those are wonderful and we appreciate those things. It's not going to get you into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible say your goodness qualifies you for heaven. You know, if you read your Bible, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us is perfect. And the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get there on your own merit. not going to get there just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? 
and, and, and you know, you, you always consider yourself to be a Christian. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents raised in church tell you you're a Christian? That makes you a Christian. You know in the Bible does it say be born in America because you're not some other religion that by default God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second. Not only when I was a child did I sit in church. Here I am sitting in church right now. I'm in front of you tonight. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I'm here? Well, while I'm glad you're here, nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying you could go to your house, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Nope, just a person sitting in your garage, right? Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, but, but wait a second, my last church I got involved, I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, I made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, could you just show that to me in the Bible where your volunteer work for the church, your leadership in the church, your membership card that God's looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere does it say that I'll get you into heaven, your church involvement. You say, but pastor, I know God. I mean, uh, I, I, I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible says they tremble. They're not going to heaven just because they know who Jesus is. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet, we're not going to see him in heaven. Everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, or being able to quote some scriptures or celebrate a holiday. Or rather, this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that terminology. They raked it through the coals. This is not about what society, movies, Hollywood, television, or the internet say. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he talking about, lukewarm? What's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. And you can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that tonight. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to raise your hand. You've made your decision. Or get ready to get your hand up. Even if you are embarrassed, better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, better than being separated from God for eternity. All across this auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? you never done this. Never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and all of your life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up and make a right relationship with God in a moment. Wherever you're at, front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you're at within the sound of my voice on this campus or online, get ready to get your hand up. God's watching you right where you're at. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Who else? Who else? Seven wise people. Eight, nine. Got you up there. Ten. Got you over here. Thank you. Got those guys up there. Thank you. Anybody else? There's about ten wise people already. 
10 wise people already. If I didn't see your hand, just give me a little wave. Thank you. Got you up there. Thank you. 11. Anybody else real quick? There's about 11 wise people. Who else tonight you're saying, I know I need to do this. I know I need to get right with God. Come on, just simply raise up your hand if that's you. Is there anybody else real quick? Thank you. Number 12. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 12 wise people. Come on, if you know that God's tugging at your heart right now, saying, come on. Come on. What, what will you become? Will you leave that old man behind. We we'll behold Jesus lifted up. And will you believe him? Anybody else real quick, real quick. Last call and I'm going to close this up. Is there anybody else? We've got 12 wise people already. If that's you, just lift your hands up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? They're pointing. Where are you at? Where are you at? Anybody else? God, I've got hands going this way. So you're somewhere within this. Where are you at? Give me a big wave if that's you. Anybody else? Got you right there. Okay. Praise the Lord. They're blending in. All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 13 wise people. Hallelujah. God is so good. Here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. It's not too late. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend, if you need a friend, once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight. Okay, can't do that till we get you down here. If you're sitting next to somebody that raised your hand, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Okay? If you didn't raise your hand, but man, you're saying, I should have done it. I should have done it. I missed out. Man, I missed out. You didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Okay, let's all stand and welcome them. And you come right now. If you raise your hand, you should raise your hand. You come. Come on down. Come on down. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, come on, come on. Make your way to the front right now. Come on down, come on down. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on. Come on, you can come too. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Praise the Lord, you guys. Thank God you guys have come. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on, okay? You already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight, okay? Now, Pastor Joel is cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance, okay? So you're not wondering what's going on, right? Okay, he's going to, first of all, lead you in a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Okay, it's easy reading. It's free. You can sit down maybe 20, 30 minutes, read through it, and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Thirdly, he's going to give you what we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Okay, or for short, we call them SPTs. Okay, it's basically a friend in church who will come alongside you and help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Remember, we talked about getting friends that will encourage you in faith because who you hang around determines who you become, right? So we're giving you a friend that will help you to become what God has called you to be as a brand new Christian. Okay? He'll describe how it works and he'll let you come right back out. Now listen, 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 listen. Let me make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Come consistently. Weekly if you can. If you can get two church services in a week, man, you're going to start growing in your walk with God. Hey, why not be radical with us? getting three, maybe four church services a week. Whoa, now we're talking, right? Okay? We feed ourselves three times a day. Why not get in church more than once a week? Okay? So, here's the promise. Give us that year sitting consistently under the teaching of the Word of God. And after that year and for the rest of your life, you will be so blessed. You'll say, man, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, you guys. Take their word for it. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. 
Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.